I, I understand Hitler. What did he say? Hey! I wasn't so happy about being a Jew. <laughs> that I was really a Nazi. Lars von Trier has contributed some of the most beautiful and perfect shots to the landscape that will never be forgotten. On the flip side, he has made some of the most offensive and repulsive films put to film. He has a special place in my heart as I love boundary breaking, and hey, when you break boundaries, sometimes you fall flat on your face, or in Lars von Trier's case, so far up his own ass. It's absolutely absurd how a man can show such competency and turn around and make movies with the intention to only flex his own achievements and show taboo. This has to be stated early, I'm no prude, my criticism will never be, it's too violent or it's too sexual. In my assessment of Lars, he sometimes would really try and tread new ground. Other times he just throws slimy poo at the wall and hope it shocks you enough into remembering the film you just watched. A few traits of Lars would be chapters, pretty annoying jump cuts for the most part, let's call them LVTCs, cause I'm going to have to mention them a lot. A camera who nobody told the script to, so just wanders aimlessly, which I absolutely love, and making you gush and look away. He was one of the first directors I started to follow when I became more interested in film. And you can see why my edgy 16 year old self liked the really edgy Danish dude that shows boobs getting cut off, genital mutilation, movies about kinky sex, and a scene where a guy tries the fattest collateral ever. Can you blame me? All this stuff is taboo, which is part of the point. Then you go into his filmography a little bit more and realize, wait, some of his movies only serve the purpose to make me, edgy 16 year old, say, wow, cool, and make old people go, disgusting. But, but, there are some gems in his filmography, which makes me even more mad at his trash movies. When Lars is at his very best, he can show you something so profound that is unique and will never be topped that has a purpose and a meaning behind it. But man, when he's at his worst, look out. <laughs> Lars was famous for founding the Dogma 95 movement with Thomas Vinterberg. The ultimate goal is to make pure film with certain limitations that cause creativity. So the director can't be credited, handheld cameras, no sets, no extras, and you get the gist. This list will not be like the Fincher list where everything besides, you know, Alien 3 is pretty close to perfect. These films have quite a range. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Before we start, if you are interested in this content, go ahead and sub and I'll keep ranking these directors. With that intro, let's start the list. God, this is going to be tough watching all of these films. No, this is not harsh at all. Where do I even start with this pile of garbage? I've heard a lot of people say that there is a good movie somewhere in these two two-hour movies. I think there is maybe an okay movie in here somewhere, but as it's currently formatted, it's terrible. My notes for these two movies are longer than my notes for five of his movies combined, so I'm going to try and slim this down. A general theme that I've noticed in my favorite movies is that they all have extremely strong hooks at the start. As a watcher, I put a lot of stock in a movie if it doesn't make me want to reach for my phone. For every movie that I watch by myself, I keep my notes app, and that's it. If that beginning hooks me, I have noticed that notes app is really the only app I have running. And this beginning is just omega cringe. <laughs> Listen to the needle drop alone. The girl laying down beaten and scarred is set up as something that's supposed to grab your attention, but it doesn't. And it leads me into thinking this is my biggest problem with this movie, the framing narrative. Stellan Skarsgård's character. The whole idea behind his character is for our protagonist to spill the hot goss to someone and present an opposing ideology to our main character. So this character only exists for Lars von Trier to give monologues on philosophy to the audience. This dynamic is later restored in the house that Jack built, but in this film, it's just so frustrating. No one has conversations like this with people. Each time a word becomes prohibited, you remove a stone from the democratic foundation. Society demonstrates its impotence in the face of a concrete problem by removing words from the language. SHUT THE FUCK! Up. Okay, thanks Lars for your TED talk in the middle of your movie. The audience for a Lars von Trier movie can put together themes from your movie without the need of a character existing only to force feed you every detail of the themes. The comparison with marine life is so cringe. Adds nothing besides force feeding you more explanations that you didn't need as a viewer. Don't get me started on this Fibonacci sequence nonsense. One makes one and one plus one. Makes two and two plus one makes three and three plus two makes five and five plus three makes eight and eight plus five makes thirteen. Can someone please tell me why it's even remotely 
important to the overarching themes being conveyed here. The themes I get from this movie are desire, exploration, pleasure, and breaking taboos. I think I can solve the puzzle. What benefit do you have from putting these WH questions on the screen? Like we don't know that the word what and where and when and why start with the letters WH. Do you think when you put this text over top the footage and Joe says one of these words, the audience is like, oh my gosh, you're right. It did start with WH. You see guys, Lars is a total genius. Stop taking me away from your movie to present me useless titles and information. The next topic I'd like to discuss about this movie is its god awful editing. The LVTCs are back and more frustrating than ever. There is literally a take where it's so obvious they just wanted to add another line without doing another take. No, you see, it's because he wants to make this totally calm scene of people talking jarring. When the actual hell is this transition? This is completely new for Lars. I'm just convinced he's doing it just to only make me mad. Next topic, the performances are terrible. Shia cannot hold a steady accent and I can't go without mentioning this either. There are three stages of age in this movie. Young, young adult, and adult. Shia plays young and young adult. Then this guy plays him as an adult. Who? I shit you not when this character first showed up. I had no idea who this was supposed to be. Christian Slater, which I love for Mr. Robot. Oh my lord, is he awful in this movie. Thankfully, he doesn't have too much screen time, but it is painfully funny, and these freakouts are so humorous. <laughs> His monologues about the trees add nothing, and they're performed so quietly. Start laughing. Oh, look. The ash trees had its fingers in the ashes. And for some reason, he comes back in the second movie to give us the same monologue about the trees. And I don't want to blame Christian Slater. I want to blame freaking Lars von Trier for this. Please help him. Direct him. Do your job. Having Stellan's character be asexual kind of helps with the framing narrative they've used in this film. It somewhat justifies its existence. Then the ending happens, and it's hilarious. Plot twist, the asexual tries to rape her during the night. But you, you fucked thousands of men. This movie was never about consent, and if you watch the four hours of content, you know, she wouldn't just fuck anyone just to fuck. There is no way this was a good point to end on. It's just trying to be a shock to the viewer and provides no interesting commentary whatsoever. What else do I have to say? I got a few things left here. Stupid complaint, but why is he showing you parts of the next film in the credits? I don't want to rail on this part too much, but it's completely indefensible to parody your own film for no good reason. There's a scene where the Antichrist music starts to play, and a kid looks like he's going to fall out of the window, but instead Shia gets him to say, Safety. What was the point of this scene? This movie should not have strayed away from the classical music it was using. I guess I should say something nice about the movie. Uma Thurman scene is pretty fantastic and memorable until it becomes totally over the top. The BDSM scenes have two great performances and actually lead to meaningful outcomes. I probably enjoyed about 30 minutes of the 240 minutes I was shown. I dislike this movie with a passion and there will never be a point for me to revisit it. Now this one is a little conflicting to me. I do think there is a good movie here somewhere, and I do love the structure to this movie. Kind of. We follow a serial killer throughout several incidents, and he is explaining to a man why he shouldn't go to hell and doubles down on all the crude stuff he has done in his life. I will tentatively divide my tale into five randomly chosen incidents. Honestly, a cool concept on paper. I'm enjoying this so far. To me, this really only works as a character study on this specific character, which is just weird to me for a Lars von Trier joint. It's not usually his style to just tell a story about a character. I don't think it works in any other way. I don't watch this movie and feel challenged by the material and see a point to it all, to be frank. Depends on how seriously you take this movie. Some say this is the most fun just because this movie embodies him the most. It pisses you off, shows you crude stuff, and tries to be extremely deep. The first incident is kind of obnoxious to me. You might as well be a serial killer. The whole incident is written by a student in film school. It lacks depth, and the only time he really goes for anything that isn't just character-driven, Lars von Trier just explains it to you through the plot magic of Verge. Or whatever one feels like calling the great architect behind it all. He just explains his philosophy to us for a good portion of this movie. Lars, show, don't tell. This is Nymphomaniac all over again, man. And I'll be honest, I really dig some of these incidents. The second one is written pretty well and is tense, and the OCD scenes are brilliant. A murderer with OCD. The score is haunting, adding to the tension. I love the rain here. The third incident is haunting but lacking depth as well. It's at least unique and kind of over the top. Again, it just depends on how you want to watch this movie. How serious do you want to take this movie? Hey, maybe sometimes you're in the mood to just watch a screwed up movie. I can't blame you. Be you, man. 60 people. I'm a serial killer, simple. 
You're weird. Why? Because I'm saying that I've killed 61 people. You said 60 before. The dialogue between characters in this movie are just unbearable at times. Easily the most offensive shit in this movie is when there is a discussion about art and icons, and this man has the gall to play clips from his older movies in a montage in his current movie that he is showing us, just like Nymphomaniac. This man is unhinged. For example, art and icons. If you watch interviews with Matt Dillon, he really had a good time with this role and you can tell there was a ton of thought put into this character, but I really don't see it. I do like how the main character tries to act smug and smart the entire time to justify his actions. When Dillon goes through the door at the end, I think it's pretty marvelous of a 15 minute ending. Sadly, this movie is slightly longer than those 15 minutes. <laughs> Let's make this quick. Love the idea behind this film. It's half documentary, half film, where Lars von Trier creates limits for Jorgen Leth to make a short film over and over again called The Perfect Human. These limitations create, well, creativity and allows us to explore other routes to filmmaking besides the traditional short film. One is told in 12 FPS, another one is told through cartoons, etc, etc. It's kind of fun to watch these two just dick around. Mostly what I get from this movie is that first sentence I said, limitations create strokes of genius and there isn't much else to get from this documentary. Glad I watched it to get a little more of LVT's perspective. Again, another movie I really don't have that much to say about. This movie really just seems like Lars having fun with his first attempt at dogma filmmaking. It really feels like a lot of the substance of this movie is just justified by him going, well actually dude, it's dogma, okay? The amount of times you see boom mics is just hilarious. He got the experience he wanted. The home movie experience. This is a home movie with people acting like they have disabilities. Its writing is probably better than the credit it receives. It's a movie about able-bodied people acting handicapped to get away with stuff and challenge the rich status quo. This movie just seems to be really on the nose at times. There's a flippin' orgy scene for just no reason. It's a frustrating movie with its moments. The ending is actually pretty awesome that almost justifies the extremely mediocre last 90 minutes that you just watched. Our protagonist that has been dropped into the world of the idiots tries to do it in front of her family and is humbled pretty quickly. I don't think it's really worth your time, but trust me, it could be a lot worse. The movie I never knew existed. I thought I knew most of his recent works, but I just never knew there was a sequel to Dogville. This could mean two things for me. It's terrible or it's just very okay and not noteworthy. Sadly, the case is it's just pretty okay. Manderlay is a continuation of Dogville with Grace recasted from Nicole Kidman to Bryce Dallas Howard, and the dads recasted to Willem Dafoe just cuz. We follow Grace in a Manderlay, which is a town where slavery is still being followed 70 years after abolition. It's supposed to be a tale about the nuances of institutionalized racism and the attention required to fix the problems? Sounds great, doesn't it? My problem is this movie is just a little on the nose, the performances are passable, and the writing is just very middle of the road and doesn't leave much to be interpreted. There's a scene towards the beginning of the movie where the father is like, it won't be that easy, and this type of dialogue kind of frustrates me, even though there is a good monologue here by Defoe. He'd been bred as an indoor bird, he really didn't have a chance. And what do you think those Negroes in there are? How many generations do you think those families made their homes behind that fence? Now they'll get a few dollars for their efforts, but they'll soon drink that up. And maybe they'll borrow a bit more from their employers, who have no doubt opened a little store full of colorful wares just for them. And of course, they'll never be able to pay back the money and they'll be trapped yet again. We have a scene where the whole family offers the slaves a job and they're handing out the contracts and you kind of get what's going on. They can't read and they're going to be given bad contracts and all of this is just kind of so boring to me. I guess you could call this an anti-white savior movie and being a story about being careful of the powers you grant people where they may not be able to handle that responsibility due to environmental causes. One thing that kind of annoys me about this film is they follow the Dogville staging, but it's just very boring in this movie. I only really see just black behind the characters. The only thing I really see besides the black staging is just a map they sometimes pull up and even that is so bland. The world of Dogville felt much more rich and the themes it was tackling to be more impressive and well written. It's a very okay movie that I don't feel the need to ever revisit but it's still much better than some of his other content. Europa is one of Lars' earlier takes, yet it feels like one of the most polished films. He is following more traditional filmmaking techniques, but still has some unique touches to this. Europa is about an American who works at a night train after the Americans controlled post-World War II Germany. He sets the scene in the most literal way imaginable. Nine. You are floating. 
on the mental count of ten, you will be in Europa. There is a criterion of this film and the visuals are just stunning. He intertwines black and white filmmaking with color on certain characters. If I showed you this film with all the knowledge you know about Lars von Trier, I don't think you would think it's him. It's a very mature film handling a very mature topic. LVT famously gave the middle finger to Cannes when he didn't win the Palme d'Or, which inevitably went to Barton Fink, but this would mark the first inciting incident for Trier that eventually would be assigned to us that he's kind of a problem child. This is a part of a trilogy. Yes, I've checked out the other two films, Epidemic and Element of Crime, but I do not believe I can offer up any crazy analysis for these two films. So I would just group them all here. Gorgeous film that totally immersed me, but isn't quite as boundary breaking as I'd like to see from him. The first movie post Europa trilogy to me is when Lars became who we know him to be today. Breaking the Waves is about this down atrocious woman who grows up in a conservative religious town in Scotland and finds a man who she quite honestly can't live without, played by Stellan Skarsgård, who apparently just kind of sold his soul to Lars von Trier because Jesus, he's in almost every movie he's made. The man has an accident on the oil rig and becomes paralyzed, jeopardizing their relationship. For being the first film made after releasing his Dogma 95 manifesto, it doesn't really follow the rules of chastity that he submitted. That's also kind of the point to Dogma 95 films. It's not really supposed to be achievable. To strive for 100% effectiveness. Naturally, we never succeed, but it's the pursuit that's meaningful. Breaking the Waves is gorgeously shot, and this is where one of my favorite Lars von Trier-isms arrive. The camera doesn't know the script. Most of Lars' movies are entirely handheld shots, but what you probably imagine in your head is wrong. When David Fincher puts something into the frame, you know damn well it's an important detail. In Lars' movies, he'll just randomly dip down the camera to feet and quickly raise it back up or something just cause. This could be deemed lazy to me, but it kind of adds a level of immersion and authenticity to his films that are unique to the space. Let's get back to Breaking the Waves. This is a narrative drama where Emily Watson absolutely puts on her acting chops. If that name seems a little familiar to you, it's the chick from Punch Drunk Love. The performance will give you visceral reactions when you start to realize the path she's going towards. Growing up in this town must be hard for women and she portrays the innocent girl who finds honest love with so much heart. She's so innocent, when her man gives her a present, she asks if she can even open it. The first time they have sex, she says thank you. This movie is so great at showing us that this guy is her world, making the tough choice even harder for our protagonist. Stellan Skarsgård's character is extremely well written as he is the character that drives this plot forward. This movie is ultimately a film about challenging a traditional relationship, especially given the circumstances. When this film develops, we move towards this blame stage for our protagonist, and this starts when the doctor says, you give him the will to live more than any doctor can do. This line is absolutely magical to me. The amount of blame just put on our protagonist now can't be quantified. Lars just likes to make movies with female leads and honestly just put them through hell. It's a pretty calculated hell though. Stalin in the hospital bed saying stuff like, if I die, it's because I'd lost love. It's so damn powerful and you can see why our protagonist follows the fate that she does. It's a pretty solid Lars entry. Melancholia is full of dread. Let me just play some of the intro shots along with the music. This isn't my favorite intro to an LVT movie, but goddamn does it rank up there. This may be Lars von Trier's most simple yet dense film. We follow a newlywed couple played by Mary Jane and Emilith from The Northman. Struggle to get to their reception on time. And when we arrive, drama almost tips over a few times. I would like to believe Lars picked a wedding reception as his setting to show us depression can come for us whenever. This day is supposed to be the pinnacle of their lives, and it's only down from here. It is no shock either that the family is absolutely loaded, so in theory there should be more happiness right? Depression is complicated and I'm not going to act like this movie has solved depression and has really interesting commentary and this is just a world changing piece of media, but at least it's thought provoking. I don't think I'm smart enough to get a complete grasp on what this movie's going for besides a bunch of half thoughts. A few ideas I get from this movie would be the fact that depressed people are content with the end, as bleak as that sounds. The earth we live in is an evil place and depressed people see it as a happy ending when it all goes poof. Justine, the one battling the most with depression during this movie, could really care less about the world's impending doom. Another idea I get from this movie is that depression, having the planet literally be named Melancholia, hits and affects all of us. Again, nothing crazy here, just half thoughts. I do not think any of these ideas about depression are extremely profound, but our dude, Stellan, please, throw a plate right. 
My only major critique of this film would be how the sister just filters her search to cater for what she wants to find. Let me add a little bit of spice. Finds it and is like, see, honey, I'm right. We are going to die. I get it. She's desperate for answers because she values life more than a depressed person. But there has to be another way to demonstrate this. I think I really only have this ahead of breaking the waves for the 1000 FPS slow-mo shots. This is much better than Mandalay. Now we got Queen Kidman in a much more rich stage full of chalk with much more fleshed out themes that hit harder. Paul Bethany's character is a really fleshed out character as well. A believable man who slowly facilitates the exploitation that Kidman gradually feels. The main theme of this movie would have to be exploitation and a criticism of capitalism. The plot is Kidman is running and hiding from gangsters in a local town named Dogville. She must convince the townspeople she is a valuable member of the community within two weeks. The gangster is symbolizing what a government protects you against. She starts to work more and more and earn less and less and spend money on useless material goods that resemble the labor she puts in. When this good that she buys gets destroyed, we get one of the best scenes of the entire movie. Even though it's a useless material good, it was all she had to show for her labor in Dogville. This is also a film about nature of humans and the consequences when given naturally evil characters governmental powers. This film definitely follows the principle that government should be able to deal with naturally evil humans if it wants to be an effective ruling body. The ending is powerful as Grace decides to grant the power to the gangsters and unload lead into all the town's members, besides the dog. To me, this symbolizes how they're all animals, which is consistent with all of LVT's movies. But the dog at least doesn't try to justify immoral actions. The dog is innocent in that manner. The town's members were all evil because humans are inherently evil in the director's eyes, and they must be put down for the sake of other towns. Before barking these orders, she goes in for another conversation with Paul Bethany's character, who on the surface wanted her to succeed the most and the dialogue they have is very telling and not very subtle. Yeah, this movie's about evil human nature and what happens when systems are in place that allow gross inequalities, which can be seen while they vote. Not exactly a wealth inequality, but an equal social class. Let me put it this way, what movie are you happy watching gangsters blow away women and children as the finale? That's powerful to me. Oh, Dancer in the Dark, the first time I enjoyed an LVT joint. The first time I watched this, I had no idea it was a musical, and about 40 minutes into the film, the music number really makes me dig my toes in. Full disclosure, I absolutely adore Bjork. I believe she is an absolute treasure. It's so, so quiet got me through some of my late teens and instantly pumped up my mood. I also enjoy musicals a lot, a lot more than I probably should. <laughs> If you didn't know, I grew up playing drums and have played for over a decade. But yes, I'm an avid music listener, as really everyone should be. Dancer in the Dark is about a woman who works at a factory who is slowly going blind. Knowing that this will pass down to her son eventually is trying to save up for a surgery for her son to save him. She eventually runs into a problem with the law and a huge mix-up. Where to start? This may be the saddest movie I've ever watched. A sad musical, you say? I have heard people claim this movie is just a little too doomer and gloomy for them, which I totally understand. Personally, I'll never really critique a movie for being too dark, especially when this movie has some purpose in being this sad. I was wondering if this was the most Lars has ever been challenged, as the musical scenes are obviously very conflicting with dogma filmmaking. I'm sure he has never had to block musical numbers. A very rewarding experience for Lars with him winning the Palme d'Or and Bjork winning Best Actress at Cannes, so no bitching from Lars here. Sadly, just abusing Bjork because there's no such thing as a non-controversial film from this man. Sorry, actually not by Lars von Trier, an unnamed Danish director. Okay, let me just look at her filmography real quick. Oh, okay. Anyways, this movie is absolutely brilliant. It reeks of competency. There are shots during the musical numbers where they used like a hundred cameras and it shows. It's obvious that Lars is trying to make a statement on the U.S. healthcare system, but to me, it's not the dominating subject of this film. It is the narrative. The narrative aspects are fantastic here. There are some very okay performances in here, but absolutely outshined by the musical numbers. York's incredible performance and some stunning moments. Dance in the Dark is the anti-musical. Everything you expect in the musical is challenged here, and you can tell by the 
lyrics of the music and how Bjork's character is infatuated with American musicals. Specifically in the song In the Musicals, musicals are referred to be as magic and how she's having a ball because it's a musical and how there's always somebody to catch me if you fall. Let's just say this musical is not like the others. The ending alone makes you speechless for minutes. I will actually give you a spoiler alert before I describe the ending because this movie is too special to me. Three, two, one, go. She's being hung and she starts to sing her last song, but this world is too cruel for her. They just cut her off in the middle of the song and just drop her. It is an incredibly grim and morbid ending, yet fitting of the tone. There is also this moment before where a friend tells Bjork that her son had the surgery and the friend gives her the son's glasses saying he won't need these. This calms her down right before she dies. This makes her realize she did everything she could for her son. And I think this is the reason we feel so much for her when she's hung, but her story is over. I've seen it a few times now and I have a recorded conversation about it over here if you're more curious on my complete thoughts. Antichrist was the movie that made LVT loudly exclaim, he is the greatest filmmaker in the world. My dude was in his bag for this movie. Antichrist is so simple in premise, yet complex in execution with innovative techniques to get seemingly easy shots that weren't so easy. Antichrist is about a couple that loses a child, leading to the wife going through therapy with her, you know, therapist husband. The product we get is one of the most haunting and dreadful movie watching experiences. I can understand if this movie isn't for everyone. I indeed had to look away from a certain pair of scissors, and I could see how some other actions would completely turn off a viewer. If you can stomach this film, you're going to see a film about grief, depression, and nature like you've never seen before. Remember what I said about introductions hooking? Well, I'm pretty confident in calling this my favorite introduction to a film ever, maybe rivaled by Old Boy. We got Big Willem D thrusting. This scene is so perfect for a few reasons. First off, all of these shots are done in a thousand FPS slow motion, comboed with the classical music, creating such an immaculate vibe. The slow motion comboed with the snow particles flying down while everything is mostly still, along with the shower bubbles is so well, you know, artsy and beautiful. After you just watch this powerhouse of a scene, you watch the couples walk to their kid's funeral with all the faces blurred in the back and almost no audio, which leads me to another great aspect of this film that I don't see a lot of people talk about. It's sound design. This movie is so careful with what it chooses to include in its scenes, and I completely recommend watching this with a good set of headphones or a speaker because this is truly an audio-visual experience. The little tears are hiding among the ferns. I can justify the LVTCs in this movie. Yay! It's adding a very comfortable tone to an uncomfortable conversation. Especially when she starts panicking in the night. Anxiety. Yes. This is physical. And this is where I need to give Lars some credit for being able to secure these actors throughout his career. This is a career best from Charlotte and the foe for me. Eh, actually, probably The Lighthouse is a better performance now, sorry. Antichrist is a movie where I get a different interpretation every time from certain scenes. The first time, since the movie is named Antichrist, I was looking for more religious themes. This most recent time, I was going to follow the narrative, follow the title cards, and just try to see more as a nature movie, and this feels like the most true interpretation to me now. Look at this movie only for the grief and nature elements. There is the zoom into to a plant, which is done electronically to look handheld and still moves in like a planar motion, one of the more unique techniques I was mentioning before. But when we zoom into it, this plant slowly, we see particles flying that look like the snow particles from earlier. Could be a reach, but to me this is signifying that we are early on and she is currently holding on to the trauma. She also starts to self-blame as a normal person would do in this situation, but it sucks because she was holding on to important information from Defoe. This gives her more to self-blame about. I love how we're baited into believing that Defoe is the morally good and perfect character in this movie, and without being overt, it's shown that he is the enemy of our story. He is so quick to dismiss the doctor's orders and says he knows what's best. No therapist can know as much about you as I do. He means well, but he just assumes that he's the most well-equipped for this situation, and that is a very selfish and domineering mindset. In the second chapter, she finally calls him out for his ignorance, and things start to heat up, and this is where the nature themes rain heavy for me. We start to see a few nasty animals and acorns dropping. The acorns could be signifying death, like her kid falling out the window. Every time an acorn falls, there's hope it'll grow into a tree, but it's impossible for all these acorns to become life. The animals signifying how nasty nature can be. Existence is nasty. Life is nasty. 
grieving will always be a part of life. Tragedy and triumph are at the cost of life. Defoe is even mentioned as Mr. Nature in the next chapter. This is when the switch is made, and she believed that he is the nature trying to hurt her by adding chaos and pain to her life. This leads to her becoming nature and hitting Defoe with the fattest Uno reverse cards. Look, I took a lot of notes here, and I have a lot of half thoughts that I'm still trying to gather, so I'm up for any other interpretations that y'all might have. I still have no idea what to think about the epilogue, but damn it, this movie makes me want to revisit more and more every time I watch it. It was really close with Dancer in the Dark, but I think Antichrist is the movie that I would go pretty comfortably at number one. Look, I hate the guy as much as the next guy, but it's hard to deny some of the films that he has made, and when you are so boundary breaking, you're gonna have some duds. Thanks for staying for the entire video. This is gonna be a pretty long one. It's gonna take me a while to get out, so I admire the patience from y'all.